You are listening to the INCJ podcast, conversations about international criminal justice. Well, hello, everybody. Uh, can I welcome you to an INCJ podcast, or you may be watching on YouTube? Uh, I'm John Scott, and this is number three in a series called the COVID Leadership Challenge. Now, COVID-19 is presenting a unique challenge to frontline workers, not just in the health and social sectors, but in criminal justice too. And at INCJ, we wanted to find out how leaders internationally were handling the issues around COVID-19. So we've started a conversation with different leaders to ask about their experience in this crisis. If you want to follow the series, you'll find it on our website, which is at criminaljusticenetwork.com. Dot net, or follow us on Twitter at INTCJ Network. Now, third up in this series, let me introduce Kirsten Havlitzczyk, who is the Executive Director of Europris, which is the European Prisons Organization. Uh, welcome, Kirsten. Now, uh, first off, tell us where you're based and are you working from home at the moment? Hi, John. Um, uh, yeah, nice to see you. Um, Yes, um, I'm based at The Hague in the Netherlands, and it's nice and sunny today. And I'm looking outside from my home office window, of course, because uh, we are uh, back into a partial lockdown in our country, unfortunately. And to be honest, our uh, office where we are normally based is already closed since mid-March. So quite a long period, and we don't expect it to open until the end of the year. And has it made a big difference working from home? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yeah, I mean, in the beginning, uh, I kind of uh, thought, oh, it's okay. It's nice. But then uh, you start missing uh, missing your colleagues, of course, the, the interaction, missing people in generally, but uh, work-related, yes, you miss your colleagues. The, the easy way of just talking to each other, saying, hey, can you do this? Or, hey, how do we do that? So uh, you always have to Zoom or call, and that makes life a bit more difficult. Yeah. I imagine. So let's let's start off by telling everybody about Europris, uh, what sort of organization it is and uh, how many members you have, that sort of thing. Yeah, so Europris is a network organization for practitioners. So um, it is based in Europe and it is for members from the whole Council of Europe region. Uh, and currently we have 34 European jurisdictions that are a member of Europris. So when I say jurisdictions, we talk about prison services. So each European jurisdiction can have basically one member. Um, the reason that Europris was established uh, was really for practitioners to have a forum for exchange and sharing knowledge. Um, so every country has a prison service and uh, there are lots of similarities but of course there are also lots of things that are different um, based on culture and how the society is um, built up so there's lots of things to learn from each other as well so that's why um, a number of director generals decided at the end of <clears throat> sorry 2011 to um, start with this organization and have a central contact point in Europe uh, for uh, um, finding expertise, for linking the countries together, for linking the countries with initiatives in the sector, and mainly to provide this, this sharing and, uh, and exchange so that we can have more humane prison systems, better correctional staff, and at the end, uh, you know, safer societies. Uh. I get it. So with the start of the COVID crisis, what, what changes have you had to make to Europris? Everything, almost. Mm. It was, uh, yeah, you know, I mean, like I said, our organization is established to pro facilitate exchange. And... Most, I mean, part of the exchange we do is online, but the main activities that are relevant for our members were 
having expert meetings, having workshops, having conferences, having actually personal exchange. So, uh, yeah. So in March, when the not just our office closed, it also meant that no more activities, no live exchanges, no physical meetings. So that was like, um, yeah, we had to reinvent ourselves to a certain extent. So that was really, really a challenge. Um, so all events were cancelled. And of course, like everybody, we are on Zoom here. So Zoom became our new reality. Uh, so we started uh, after a while to initiate meetings and even a workshop recently uh, on uh, online. And we can see that people get more used to it. Uh, in the beginning, it was still a bit difficult. You can also see that when you have groups where people know each other, it's easier to interact um, than if you get new groups together. Uh, but still, I mean, uh, yeah, people are still interested, to, of course, to learn and to hear from each other. I mean, everybody misses the informal exchange at the coffee break, but uh, you have to do something. Mm -hmm. So that's what we did. We also... Um, immediately thought, okay, so we are here to serve the needs of our members. So what can we do if we can't meet? What 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 would be the needs of our members? So like you said, sharing is important. So and this was a new situation for everybody. Like COVID had to stay out of prisons. But how do we do that? How is this managed in a good way? So we started uh, in March immediately uh, by setting up a web page. Um, where we asked countries to send to us whatever they have on measures, protocols um, that they uh, implement in their countries. So we set up this webpage and published all the information by country, information from international organizations, from Council of Europe bodies, from the WHO, whatever came in so that you have one page where you, where you find a lot of um, information about other how other countries are handling this. And another, I think, quite important uh, initiative actually came from the sector. And it's just that Europe has kind of took it over uh, to manage it in a more comprehensive way, was a spontaneous mailing group that came up. Uh, we have in this mailing group now 90 European experts from uh, all over Europe who um, ask each other operational questions, daily questions, like how do you, uh, how do you deal with, uh, in the beginning it was about uh, face mask, protective equipment, testing policies. Um, and in this mailing group, they just put in a question to their, in the group, and then every country who wants, they respond. And what Europris does, we collect all the responses every day, put them in a sheet, uh, so you have them in a structured overview for this question. We got so many responses and we published them on our website. So this is a, a mailing group which has been very, very active. Uh, we started it on the 30th of March. It went down a little bit in the summer, like mm. the whole, you know, COVID. Uh, everybody felt a bit like it's maybe not exactly gone, but it's uh, the, the most pressing questions had been answered. But now that we are all seem to be back in the second wave, uh, I can see the mailing group getting very active again. And, so it's uh, like a frequently asked questions and a place to come. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's a very, you know, people ask it and they get the same day or the next day they get the responses. So it's a very uh, hands-on uh, tool to, to exchange with each other, to get fast information that are on a very practical level. Yes. Yeah. Well, that's that's that, that's really that's really good, and in a way, that's the the practitioners, the people doing the real job, are driving that change, aren't they? Yes, yes. It's uh, it's. I mean, we are. What our role is is only to facilitate it, but uh, the questions and the indication of what they need it comes from the sector, and they share exchange with each other because I mean they are the experts. That's not us. I mean, we just help them yeah. to to talk to each other. Yeah. What do you think has been your biggest challenge as a leader through this time, Kirsten? Um, well, if I look at, at Europris, at the Secretariat itself, I think it was very much to keep the team motivated. You know, mm -hmm. when everybody goes at home and sitting at their own computer, 
it's uh, and and uh, events went down. And I mean, on the day that we left the office, I told my team, well, I don't know what we will be doing in two weeks <laughs> because uh, we are doing events and now we can't. So maybe we just go to read a book. But it turned out totally different. So we actually got really, really busy um, adapting to the new situation, but still keeping the team motivated and also mentally healthy, you know, that they felt okay being at home. So we also started to meet each other outside at some occasions. And uh, we actually recently started to um, uh, meet in a, in a different office space for two days a week. And I can see that people need that. So that was that was important for me in or, order to keep the organization going. Um, finding value for our members was very important to me. So like I said, we had to kind of reinvent ourselves. How can we as Europe still be a, a valuable source, a valuable uh, contact point for our members? And yeah, and on a personal, organizational, but also on a personal level, I think I had to get acquainted much more with technology, you know, like the whole Zoom and how does it work? And uh, that that was uh, also a challenge. Uh, I think that's a challenge, was a challenge for all of us. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I get that. What worries have your member organizations brought to you about the impact of COVID-19? Um. Well, I mean, the, the, the first and foremost worry was, of course, um, keeping the virus out of the prison. I mean, uh, prisons are very closed environments and uh, the idea of getting COVID into the prison on a, a larger scale would, would be, um, uh, yeah, <laughs> I mean, terrible for staff, for prisoners, for everyone. So that is... And how to take quick and appropriate measures, um, that, that was the, the, the main concern. And I must say what I, what I saw uh, from uh, how prison services reacted, I think I, I really, um, how to say that uh, good in English? I, um, <laughs> I was very positively surprised how quick uh, prison services moved to adapt to the new situation and to make sure that staff and prisoners are safe, as safe as possible. And of course, that entailed that they had to take actions that were not appreciated by everyone, especially, you know, in prison, there are not many things to do, but um, I mean, compared to the outside world. So if you have to limit that, that has a very, very strong impact uh, on the prisoners, also on their mental health. Um, yes. Do you have an overview uh, picture of how successful different prison services were at keeping COVID out of their populations? Um, yes, we have collected uh, also on our daily uh, mailing, we have collected the numbers on uh, infection rates of prisoners and staff. And uh, I think overall, like you can say they have done, uh, they've done a very good job. Uh, so there are quite a number of countries who had no infections at all in the prisons or very, very low numbers. And uh, as I said, they took very uh, appropriate measures immediately. Of course, visits were closed. Um, the whole movements in and out of prison was um, either restricted or came to a um, stop as far as possible. Uh, protective equipment was uh, provided. Um, so uh, many, many, many things, uh, the, the way of inflow and outflow of prisoners, testing policies. So uh, lots of measures with, which actually uh, had, um, had good results, yes. And do you think they've paid a price in their in their regime? Have there been more tensions with uh, prisoners not seeing their families and uh, impact on mental health and that sort of thing inside prisons? Yes, I mean, I, I, it would it would uh, of course, of course, it has impact. I mean, you know, it has impact on us being on the outside. Mm. Um, uh, so it definitely has an impact uh, both on staff and prisoners. What we what we saw it was really essential was communication. So if prison services were able to communicate in a good way, 
what kind of measures are taken and why are they taken and how they will be implemented. So that <clears throat> we could see that that was a, was a big um, advantage and it increased so much the understanding. And, uh, and what was also interesting to see that um, staff basically were in the same, can you say that in English, we're in the same boat as prisoners. Yes. And both of them realized, the prisoners as well, that staff were taking a risk by coming into the prisons. Um, so they were not able to work from their home office. So they had to come to prison. So there was, I think, also a bit of, um, of course, not a never with everyone, but overall uh, an understanding and a respect for each other in a, in a certain way. So that, That's, I think, very profound, that idea of, the community in a prison and prison officers uh, and on the front line alongside prisoners, that shared idea of shared community. Has that changed the balance in the relationships, do you think, in prisons? Um, I, I wouldn't be able, I wouldn't be able to say that, but I think what, what it uh, made clear is that uh, because this was now communication related to COVID, but I think it's it became clear how important mm. communication is and uh, to to keep up uh, good relationships. Yeah, um, yeah maybe. To... Sorry. No, please do continue. No, I just wanted to come back because your initial question was uh, how much impact did it have on the regime for prisoners yeah. on the activities? How much did it limit? Uh, um, and of course, there are a number of points. I think. Most importantly, were the visits, because visits of family, um, contact with families is so, so important. And uh, they had to be stopped uh, in most of the prisons or severely restricted. But in most of the prisons, actually, visits totally stopped. And what, what we could see um, was that there was also an immediate understanding um, of the urgency to provide alternatives for the physical visits. And even in countries where there were um, security considerations for many, many years about the introduction, for example, of video conferencing with family, steps were taken suddenly um, very quickly to introduce it because th there was a need for it. And uh, there were lots of um, mobile phones purchased and brought into the prisons, iPads. Um, there was an uh, increase in um, money for, uh, for calling or even it was for free. So there was one, on the one side, there was the restriction. On the other side, they immediately looked for alternatives. Um, it was more difficult on the activities level, um, like uh, uh, education, work, um, a lot of uh, workplaces had to stop. Um, on the other hand, where it was possible to keep enough distancing, it was also, I thought, I found it fantastic to see that prison service workshops started to produce protective equipment and masks in, in huge, huge numbers, and not just for the prison, but also for the outside world. So I thought that was a really, really good uh, initiative. And also... You know, you could prisoners could show also their commitment to the and, and bring a contribution also for for everyone by the production of this equipment. Um, education uh, stopped for a while. There we have also seen some switch to digital uh, education, and yeah, of course the time out of cells. That was uh, that was pretty much limited, uh, and and they kept sometimes groups of prisoners so that you, not everybody could mingle with everyone. But yeah, of course, this this has a very big impact, and uh, and it was important to look for providing alternatives. So, and like you said, mental health, um, a large large population uh, in uh, prisons have mental health problems of different uh, severity. And yeah, spending more time alone in your cell, uh, not having contact with your family or very different contact with your family can be, uh, doesn't have good effect, of course. So get the impression that it, uh, uh, it might be a slightly extreme thing to say. It's a bit like at a time of war, 
you have to move really fast. And so you invent and introduce new things that would take months or years in normal time. You do very fast, but you have a price to pay. Um, so introducing digital opportunities to do um, video conferencing, for example, you can imagine security issues would stop lots of those innovations and get in the way of that. And maybe they've introduced new things really fast, but the price that they've had to pay in not seeing families and, uh, and people's isolation and mental health and not maybe getting as much exercise or being able to go to work placements in the community. So w gains and losses all at the same time. It must have been really tough inside an institution during the last uh, six or seven months. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure. I mean, I, I like I said, I'm I'm not uh, I'm not in an institution. I, I only hear the stories, and I know that everybody was under extreme pressure and under extreme stress uh, to react to the constantly changing situation. Uh, as you know, I mean, um, if you look at the principle of normality, prisons should be a reflection of what is happening in the outside world. Uh, in the outside world, it, it, it got uh, from one wave to the other or more uh, more infections, more lockdowns. So, and the prisons moved in the same direction, of course. So, um, I'm uh, wondering, you know, the very fact that we're using that phrase, that word lockdown, which is, I think, a prison word, um, whether within our general community, we'll have more sympathy for the loss of freedom that, imprisonment means the fact that people have felt constraints in their their normal life um because the loss of freedom we maybe we take our choices for granted and maybe people will understand what imprisonment means more yeah but, that that would be a so-called bonus of the well it'll be the interesting whether the people prison. reflect what it's like not to be able to travel where you want or leave your home when you want um but maybe that's uh, maybe maybe that's a, a question we'll have to have to return to. Um, well, let's um, move a little bit further forward on this uh, outcomes of, of COVID, because just as you've said how um, uh, the impact on the institutions, uh, one of the things that has interested me is how people on the front line have come up with creative ways, practitioners themselves have come up with new ideas. Uh, and I'm wondering whether prison officers um, have uh, come up with new practices or new methods uh, during this um, period, and whether you can share any illustrations of that with us. Um. Yeah, I mean, um, maybe not exactly from prison officers, but um, one one interesting uh, development uh, was, you know, that prison overcrowding is in, is generally an issue um, mm -hmm. of discussion and of concern. Um, and due to the crisis, uh, there was, um, um, of course. Uh, prison services looked into um, reducing the um, number of prisoners so that they could they didn't have to use multi-person cells they could use single cells in general to reduce the pressure within the prison of the number of people um, uh, at the same time the courts uh, stopped working so there was a lower inflow into the prison but for uh, the courts that were working, there were also uh, um, considerations to, uh, re in order to reduce the inflow so that certain um, uh, crimes, of course, uh, petty crimes would not, uh, would no longer be, uh, um, uh, would no longer be prosecuted for a prison sentence, but for maybe a fine or a bail or, and on the other hand, in the prisons themselves, they also looked for early release measures. Um, so that, uh, of course, there was a consideration of the um, seriousness of the crime of the person. So certain categories of offenders, like sex offenders, they were excluded from such early release measures. But um, quite, quite a large number uh, was also possible to release earlier. So, so it was interesting to see that the... Um, thinking about who should actually be in prison 
and also who how long they should stay or if maybe alternative measures uh, are really an alternative uh, for prison sentences so that this um, this actually created uh, uh, a less crowded prison system so could could we stay with this in the future could we evaluate this positively and see uh, um, and also making judges more aware of uh, of other opportunities um, of course we also realize on the other side um, that if less people come into prison but still they have done a crime that needs some uh, uh, how to say punishment and if they come into probation uh, that that increases the the pressure on another sector which has to be addressed then. But I mean, talking about prisons, I think it would be good if this starts a thinking process, an acting process, preferably also um, in, in, the, in sentencing and, and release. Um, yeah, I, I, I get that. And prison officers will be absolutely key in uh, deciding um, which offenders uh, can be released early or are best prepared to have a community part of their sentence if they can be released early. Okay. I want to move on maybe to reflect on the impact of, uh, of the crisis uh, as, as you, as, uh, as an individual really, and as in, in a leadership role. Has anything made you rethink your approach to work, Kirsten? <sighs> Um, to the work that we do within yes. Europe. Mm. Yeah, of course. I mean, uh, my life was for a large part traveling, <laughs> which is not anymore. And you wonder, of course, what will it be uh, post-COVID? Um, and uh, it's, I think, I mean, uh, we have seen that a lot is possible online, but not everything. So well, what, we want, what we want to think about is to, to see in the future what kind of activities that we do could, could be actually uh, replacing travel. But we also realize that, and that's, that's I think very strongly we all realize how important it is personal contact to actually meeting in person and to have informal time together. Because uh, if you are in an online environment, it's you talk about what needs to be talked about, but uh, you don't really take the time for um, for a coffee together. And oh, by the way, I want to discuss with you this and that. So, uh, and actually, I'm expecting um, that our work will become more busy than less busy because uh, I can imagine that we we found out that online meetings can actually be quite good. So, on top of the uh, let's say we have for experience for example, expert groups that meet once a year uh, at a personal meeting, which is not a lot. Uh, but uh, yeah, so, I mean, we are a small organization, so we have to see how much can we do in a year. But now we have had numerous, uh, uh, like, two-hour meetings with those expert groups online, which were really, really good because uh, people shared and told about what they were doing during COVID, etc. So I could imagine that in the future, we still have the one year physical meeting, but we add some online meetings. So actually, I think our life uh, might become more busy, busier than it was before. Um, besides that, it made us also think about an issue that is everywhere on the agenda, which is the environment and the climate change. So also to make some policy, uh, environmental policy for the organization, where we also think about which, how, how to travel, uh, how to, uh, can you use the train or uh, some other means than uh, to fly, if to fly, if it's necessary at all to travel, and then take further steps in thinking and how uh, the environmental impact that our organization has can be reduced. So, um, we have started an initiative for some other network organizations to think about it. But this actually came out of COVID. Uh, so I, I wonder if we would have thought about that otherwise. So, and, find... yeah, and, and finally, I would never, I thought I would never say that, that I really miss going to the office. <laughs> <laughs> but do, 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 so let's let just reflect on that a little. Do, do you think the time traveling was wasted? I mean, um, was that 
dead time that you've got back into your life or did you enjoy the travel? <laughs> it's a little, no, I mean, dead time, definitely not because the travels where uh, it's always uh, good to see people, to talk, uh, but it was a lot. So uh, to be honest, in the beginning, I didn't miss it because I was traveling much to, for my personal taste, mm. um, but not traveling at all is uh, is a different story. So uh, yes, of course, we, we missed the uh, to see the people and we, we see that they miss to be with each other and being able to talk. Um, but uh, no, it's not black and white. There, there's the truth in the middle, right? <laughs> so the learning for you is about balance, really. And the other thing w which we laughed at was about how important the office, the bringing together of your team is and the work-life balance and the team being together is something that, not being able to do it has brought into very sharp focus for you. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So getting the blend right is something that uh, you, 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 as a group you're going to have to work on, I suspect. Yeah. W will Europris go back to the way it was before? Um, like, yeah, like I said, yes and no. Uh, we will go back, but we might have some additional <laughs> work because we – kind of discovered the online uh, way of working, which is, like I said, it's an advantage. It, I mean, it's cheap. It doesn't cost anything uh, to bring people together. And it also opens up possibilities for people that from prison services that otherwise could not travel either for time constraints or money. And actually money could be an issue um, after, after COVID when traveling is allowed again, because the whole COVID-19 situation has uh, asked a lot of investments from prison services in many ways, you know, if you speak about protective equipment or the, the digital technology that they had to introduce. And so there is, uh, there. I think there are budget constraints all over uh, Europe in prison services. So we will have to think about uh, more online uh, 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 offers for our members. Yes, definitely. And what I was wondering was, are different people attending your events because they don't have to pay to go on airplanes? You mean the online events? Yeah. Of there. Um, ah, good question. I mean, we have we have had expert meetings. We only had one workshop, really workshop. Um, there was. Yeah, I wouldn't say it was too different. Um, we we had uh, the uh, for this for our summer course we had a webinar, and there we had like hundred people registering for the webinar from all over. And normally there are maximum like twenty twenty five allowed in, so that you can definitely say you reach a wider audience, and that's that's what you 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 have more people. That's for sure. You have more people. Yeah. Well, m maybe that's a, a signpost to the way, way, way you can develop. Do you think lockdown has changed you as a person? I hope not. <laughs> no, I think like, uh, I don't know. I think it's like all of us. You just realize more what is really important in your life. You know, family, friends, personal contacts. This is really what, this is really what makes our life happen. Um, and important and yeah uh, and you you realize more what you miss if it's not there of course uh, and what is really important like I like culture I like theaters and uh, not being able to to go into a theater I uh, I missed it or to concerts or but um, it, it wouldn't it's, I wouldn't that is not a change of a person it's more like realizing what is important in your life maybe I would say that, yeah. Uh, and have you had more space to do things like reading? Yeah, yeah, I thought so. I thought so when we closed the office. But uh, actually, no, I think my life was pretty, pretty busy. Uh, and uh, yeah, no, I love reading, but uh, I, I didn't, I don't think I read more than in times that and then I was traveling. Uh, okay, so if I asked you what was the best book you read during lockdown, what would you say? Um, Grand Hotel Europe from uh, Dutch writer Leonard Ilja Pfeiffer. 
Okay, so that's okay. what you'd recommend us all to go out and buy a copy. Yeah, yeah, it's a it's a it's a big book, but it's a nice mixture of um, a love story and uh, somebody uh, who is. Uh, Writing about his love story, it's a it's a detective because they are looking for something. But the Grand Hotel Europe idea is actually uh, the let's say the most interesting part is about how Europe is developing in uh, actually the the whole um, uh, how do you say it? Uh, no, I can't find the word. When people massively we are traveling, you know, when uh, people from journey. Asia are coming to Europe. Sorry, yeah. on a journey. Yeah, yeah, no, but you know that the the cities are flooded by tourism, and yes. that the old Europe is a bit disappearing because there is so much new Europe, especially Asia, coming in, uh, traveling, and tourism, mass tourism. That's the word I was looking for. So how this is changing Europe, and uh, so this, it's it's very interesting. Uh, it's very interesting reflections on that. Yeah. Well, I'm I'm ordering a copy on Amazon as as as, as we speak. Yeah, yeah. You one, would, one, of, like one of the one of the things I've uh, asked people to think about is: Have you got a challenge for other leaders that you want to throw out? That you want a question that you would like to put to other other leaders that, that we should all be thinking about at this time? Oh, wow! That's uh, cool. That comes a bit. Uh question something that you've you've been in the back of your mind that you've been thinking hmm. but you mean just like everyone or yeah yeah every, because in a way as as the boss of an organization it's quite a lonely place to be isn't it and is there anything you've been thinking about that um oh you mean in that term in terms of leadership yeah yeah, well, uh, always take good care of your team. Uh, always keep close to how they feel and how they are. What I noticed was that, um, you know, people react very different to the situation. Um, mm. People have really different needs. And uh, you have to, you, you can go from your own perception of what you think is right but then if you uh, listen to people and you can see that it doesn't feel right for them, then you have to adapt to that, I think. And I can, so there is really carefully listen and see what is, what measures do you think are important and have really to be done, even if the person doesn't like it, but try to listen to the person, try to understand why, why they would not, for example, I had, um, do we have time? I can give a short example. <laughs> yes, yes, please do. No, yeah. really interesting. So like I, I, when we started with COVID, I had an opening with my team every morning at 9.30 so to talk about, okay, uh, how are you? But also like what's, well, what's on the table today? And then uh, at the end of the day, we had the closing. So I thought it was a great idea because uh, we could talk about through the day, we had some time for social but then at a certain point, I got some signals that maybe two times a day is maybe a bit too much to get everybody on the. And later on, there were uh, colleagues that said, uh, oh, maybe I don't need it every day. While other colleagues, when I, oh, I thought like, okay, um, hmm, do I like that or not? But then I thought, well, okay, if, if you force somebody into that, it doesn't, it's not very helpful. But then when I talked to the other colleagues, they said, yeah, yeah, but we want it every day. We think it's really good. So I think be flexible also and adapt to uh, to what what persons need and what they can deal with, especially in those situations where that are not normal. Let's say, and that is a really big challenge, isn't it? Because um, what's right for one person could be overbearing for somebody else. So that's yes. a, that, that's that's a real challenge. Yeah. Okay. So it's just kind of uh, uh, check it. Uh, talk to them and not just uh, think what is right, but uh, try to get it actually back from your uh, uh, staff, what they, okay. how they feel. Yeah. So a listening leader is, is a, is a rare thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I want to uh, end by asking, do you have any advice for your members, all those uh, organizations that represent 
tens of thousands of people working in prisons. What advice do you have for them at this very difficult time? Because COVID is uh, rising very fast around Europe again. Yeah, yeah. Well, keep sharing, keep sharing, keep talking to each other, keep learning from each other, keep listening to to good practices and uh, and use Europress wherever wherever you can wherever you think we can be helpful so we are here for for you <laughs> that's uh, yeah well i think that's a really good note on which to finish and uh, kiss and thank you very much indeed for your time uh we're going to sign off now and uh, i'm hoping people have found this uh, as interesting and as fascinating as I have. We hope that you out there are staying safe and we and also that uh, you'll uh, enjoy being part of this series. Uh, goodbye and thanks very much, Kirsten. Uh, podcasts like this are available on your normal provider uh, and they are available under the INCJ podcasts. Thanks very much indeed, everybody, and we'll Thank stay you, safe and we'll sign off. Thank you, Kirsten. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you. You have been listening to the INCJ podcast, conversations about international criminal justice. To find out more, go to our website at criminaljusticenetwork.net or follow us on Twitter at INTCJ Network.